Hello, my name is Rod Dickerson, and this is Thy Will Be Done. This is going to be an amazing study, an amazing venture and journey into the Word of God. So I want you to get your notebooks so you can take notes. I want you to have your Bibles and your concordance, anything that you need to help you with this awesome lesson. Today we're going to be in a very familiar passage of Scripture. It comes out of Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. We're going to cover that entire text. Proverbs chapter 3, of course we know chapter three, verses four, five, and six. We know about trust in the Lord. But before we get started, I want you first of all to pray for me. Yes, I want you to pray for me. Um, I just had a very good friend of mine who I've been knowing for 43 years. We've ran track together. We've been roommates together. We've traveled to many states together. We lived in California together. We partied together. Um, his girlfriend, my girlfriend was the cousin, first cousin of his girlfriend. So we're very close, very tight. My friend, Roosevelt Frierson, has made his transition. No, it wasn't due to the coronavirus, but he did have blood clogs that I guess he wasn't aware of, and somehow one traveled into his heart, and he died. Um, just a couple of days before his birthday, a couple of days before we were planning to take a trip to Atlanta, although I'm going to admit I wasn't planning on going, but when I got the call from him on the Wednesday that we were supposed to leave, I said, now Roosevelt going to talk me into going to Atlanta with him. And I probably would have went if he insisted. That was like a brother to me. I love him. I'm going to be delivering his eulogy. So I'm just asking prayer, not really just for me, but for his entire family, the Frierson family, for his beautiful sister, Tammy, and all of his brothers, his mother and father, his pastor, he's a retired pastor, but he is a show enough man of God. He knows the word, and I'm just honored to be able to step in the gap for him because he probably could have done this himself, but he wants to console his wife and comfort his wife and family, which is very uh, honorable and understandable. So pray for the Fri Frierson family and pray for me. But we also want to pray right now for all of you who are watching uh, for us to get our spiritual ears and eyes of understanding keen to this word. So let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we are just so thankful and grateful that you are an awesome and amazing God. There is no God besides you. Lord, we are just so thankful that you have made yourself manifest in Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We thank you for indwelling us, for placing us within the body of Christ, for giving us all that we will ever need to live godly in Christ Jesus. Lord, we thank you from eternity past to where you saw all of our faults. You looked past our faults, but you saw all of our needs. And Lord, for those who are listening right now, many of them have had uh, difficulties with the coronavirus. Some have lost family and friends and acquaintances. Some are still mourning. So in the name of Jesus, Lord, we ask that you will comfort where no one else can comfort that you would bring peace, love, and understanding. And Lord, that you would touch all the lives of those people and those who are on the front lines, the doctors and the nurses and the LPNs and the phlebotomists and everybody that work in a hospital, Lord, that you would touch them in a very special way. Keep them from any forms or ideas or thoughts of danger. Lord, we just ask that you would guide, guard, and govern our lives. Touch us all in the very name of Jesus. Touch this, this message that it will go forth and touch the lives of people in the way that it should be touched. We ask that your perfect will be done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And let all the folks say amen to that. Once again, we're in Proverbs chapter 3. Um, we're going to read from verse 1 all the way through verse 6. I may even include verse 7 for contextual um, structure. But the title of this message is what happens 
when you say yes, Lord. Turn to your neighbor. What happens? <laughs> I'm just kidding. We're not in church. Well, we are the church. But what happens when you say yes, Lord? Well, right off the bat, I'm going to say some amazing things can happen. Some wonderful things can happen in your life. God will pour out miracles that you never saw coming. He'll bless you in ways that you never saw. He'll open doors that no man can close, and he'll close doors that no man can open. God is an amazing God, and God is on your side. He's your heavenly Father. He wants to bless you. He wants to encourage you. He wants to build you up, and he's leading you by his Holy Ghost. You know, the Holy Ghost's job is to woo you to Christ. Everything about this Bible is about Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for your written word. We thank you for the living word. We thank you that the word was made flesh, flesh and dwelt among us. So Lord, as we get into this lesson, lead us and guide us, Lord. And so let's read. Um, this is a proverb that deals with rewards of wisdom. There is a reward for wisdom. There's a reward for common sense. <laughs> but let us read. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart, but, but let thine heart keep my commandments. Here's a reward. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Verse 3. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Mercy certainly suits my case. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. Verse 4. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. And then verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not unto thine own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. What happens when you say yes, Lord? Well, you know, when you say yes, Lord, just from a theological perspective, you're surrendering to the very sovereignty of God. God is a sovereign God, and when we look at the definition of sovereignty, we basically say that God is the supreme authority and all things are under his control. <laughs> the very galaxies and stratosphere and atmosphere, the earth and every element seen and unseen, every element of existence is in God's control. God is the sovereign Lord of all and by an incontestable, an incontestable right. God has an incontestable right. I have to repeat that as the creator, the owner and the possessor of heaven and earth. Whoa. Sovereignty is an attribute of God based upon the premise that God as the creator of heaven and earth have absolute right. God has absolute right and full authority to do or allow whatever he desires. And God has a desire for each and every one of us. From eternity past, way before the foundation of the world, God knew your plight. He knew your timeline. He knew your difficulties. He knew your frailties. And God has placed elements of victory, joy, love, prosperity in your life, despite whatever things may come in this world. Because you're his child and you represent him in this earth. So God has the sovereign authority. And when you say yes, Lord, you're saying yes to the sovereign authority to a God that has all right to do whatever he wills. But God is not a God that creates robots. He's a God that wants us to do according to his will by loving him. He wants us to love him. Yes, he does. So when we look at these things and we talk about the word trust, you know what is synonymous with the word trust? Faith. And we love that word. Oh, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. For without faith, 
It is impossible to believe God because he first must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder to them that diligently seek him. Now let's bag that up a little bit. Let's talk about that. Faith is. So faith is something. And the verse is going to continue to tell us what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So whatever you're hoping for in Christ Jesus, your faith has made it materialize in such a way that it will come to pass in due time, in due season. Oh, Philippians 1, 6, I am confident of this very thing, that he will begin a good work in you, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God's going to supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Sometime you need to preach and pray to yourself the word of God and encourage yourself by the word of God. <laughs> If you just get the word of God deep down in your soul, it will be so easy for you, for you to say yes, Lord. So let's look at there. Basically, uh, I wrote this down. When you say yes, Lord, your faith will be tested and exposed. <laughs> your faith, even when Jesus Christ uh, came on the scene, he was tested and exposed when he went uh, in Matthew's chapter four, when he was led up into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil for well, when he was led into the wilderness, he was there 40 days and 40 nights. And as he began to get weak at his weakest point, here comes the devil, the tempter saying, if you be the son of God, why don't you command these stones to be made bread and eat? What's wrong with you? Jesus said, <laughs> He knew he was to be tested and he going, he's going to be exposed as the son of God because he's not going to do what the tempter says. He's going to do what God led him to do despite the suffering, despite the suffering. And this is going to take us into another category of this lesson, but I don't want to go there right now. Despite the suffering, he said, nevertheless, uh, I'm not going to tur turn these stones to bread because God's word is all I need. <laughs> Basically, that's what he said. That's what he said. Why don't you turn these stones to be made bread? Jesus said, it is written, thou shalt not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Do you realize that the living word <laughs> is talking about the word and he's telling the word to, to Satan? He's standing on his own self. He's standing and believing on his own word and he's trusting that his word shall not return void. That is an amazing episode. And of course we know the tempter kept picking at Jesus for a little while. And then when he noticed that he stood on the truth, he left him alone for a season. There have no temptation taken you. And we're going to break this verse down too. There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. He will not allow you. Now listen to that word, allow you. Many people like to substitute that allow you and say, God won't put on you no more than what you can bear. That's not what that verse is saying. Now what God will put on you is an anointing. God will put on you the power to endure. That's what God will put on you. God will equip you to do the work of the ministry. That's what he'll put on you. But this, this particular scripture that I'm talking about is talking about the moments of temptation that all people, whether you're black, white, Jew, Protestant, Catholic, uh, Indian, no matter where you come, whatever your geographical existence is, all of us are subject to temptation. We're all subject to temptation. There is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able, but will with the temptation make a way to escape so that you may be able to say, yes, Lord. Oh, <laughs> Okay. I know it doesn't say yes, Lord. It says so that you may be able to bear it. And when you bear it, that gives you an experience and a testimony where you can say, yes, Lord. I believe it's Paul that wrote in, wrote in Romans chapter five. All of these wonderful verses are coming into my spirit where it says, we glory 
in tribulations, knowing that tribulations worketh patience, patience, experience, and experience hope. And that hope make us not ashamed because the love of God is shared abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost is reminding you that in this hour of temptation, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how bad it looks, no matter what the struggle, no matter if you're up on the hill or whether you're down in the valley, God has empowered you to endure and say, yes, Lord. <laughs> now, your faith will be tested and exposed. Three basic categories for faith for the believer. Three basic categories. I'm sure we could discuss it and argue that there's more, but there's three that I want to talk about. Number one, if faith. Yeah, we're born again. We're believers. We say we love the Lord, but we have an if faith. What is an if faith? If God do this, I'll bless him. If God do this, I'll worship him. If God get me a new house, I'll stop complaining. If God get me a new car, I'll go to church more. If God get me a husband or a wife, I'll be a child of God. That's an if faith. That means it's contingent upon something. You're telling God, you're bargaining with God, and you're telling them, God, you got to do this for me. Or else I'm not going to be able to worship you, even though you're almighty God and, 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 and you're so holy and you deserve to be praised. But God, I, I got to have something. Do you have an if faith? Well, there's another one, a though faith. <laughs> What's a though faith? Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That's what Job said. Now, Job you know, you know the story of Job, what he went through and all that he had lost and the sickness and even his friends coming saying, well, you must have done something, bro, for all this to happen to you. Even his wife told him, why don't you just curse God and die? Why don't you just allow mercy to fall on you? Just get rid of yourself. Get out of this pain. And the best way to do it is just turn your back on God. Do we turn our back on God when we don't have faith, when we are so down when we are uh, 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 troubled, when we have anxiety, when we are non-believing, are we turning our back on God? Are we saying, God, I just don't believe you're going to do it? What if God has bargained with the devil and said, and the devil said, all you got to do is just delay it. They won't worship you no more. They won't say, yes, Lord, anymore. All you got to do is delay the blessing for another day. Delay it for another moment. Delay it for another year. Delay, make it seem like it's being delayed for five years, even though it's right up the road. Just imagine if Jesus Christ did that when he was in the wilderness being tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. Or you could have an even if not faith. Even if not. How many believers today have an even if not faith? What's an even with not faith, if not faith? You know the story about the three Hebrew boys. You know it very well about them being cast into the fiery furnace by Nebuchadnezzar because they wouldn't bow down and worship the image. They wouldn't bow down to this idol God that, that Nebuchadnezzar created, this idol of himself, proclaiming himself to be God. They wouldn't bow down. They said, oh, king, we are not going to bow down. And we know that God can deliver us. And we know that God is going to deliver us from your hand. But even if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow down. You know we have our civil rights because our forefathers, they didn't get an opportunity to see uh, what we have today. They didn't live to long enough to see the rights that we have, the voting rights that we have. And only 15% of all registered voters even exercise their right to vote. Yet many of our forefathers died. They were beaten. They were, uh, uh, had dogs sicked on them. They had water hose, water drench them down the street. 
and we forsake that opportunity and allow people to get in office that don't have our best interests and we complain when God has provided us a way. I know I got political and some people think religion and politics don't go together. Well, you haven't read the Bible. <laughs> There's so much religion and politics in the Bible, it will make your head spin. So either you can have an if faith or you can have a though faith, or you can have an even if not. Because you know, God doesn't owe me anything. And God doesn't owe you anything. We were born in sin and shaping in iniquity. There's none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But thanks be to God, he looked beyond my faults. I'm about ready to preach. He looked beyond my faults and he saw my needs. Praise God. So when you say, yes, Lord, amazing things begin to happen. Saying yes to God <laughs> means to say no to yourself. For the steps of a righteous man you have put together. No, it doesn't say that. For the steps of the righteous man, you purchase with your own money and wealth. No, it does not say that. For the steps of a righteous man were bought at the department store. No, it doesn't say that. For the steps of a righteous man were given to us by pastors and preachers and bishops and evangelists. No, it doesn't say that. It says, for the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. God has already preordained a life for you to walk in. God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called you to glory and virtue, by which are given unto you exceedingly great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, and beside this giving all death, Add to your faith. Add to your faith. Add to trusting in God. A yes, Lord. Add to your faith. Diligence. Add to your faith. Brotherly kindness. Add to your faith. Temperance. Add to your faith. Love. For if you do these things, you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. But he that has forgotten these things are blind. And you can't see that if you just say, yes, Lord, you begin to see the life and the reward of worshiping a holy God in spirit and in truth. When you say, yes, Lord, You'll be like the man in Psalms 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he do shall prosper. You shall prosper in Jesus' name. When you say yes, Lord, you begin to realize that God is on your side. When you say yes, Lord, you realize that you're your own worst enemy. <laughs> you know, the things that have happened to me in my life, most of them, 99.9% .9 of them, were my fault. <laughs> I can attest to that. I've made some bad choices and I've made some bad decisions. I've went left when I should have went right. I've went right when I should have went left. I've got with people I shouldn't have never got with. I've lost money. But God's grace. God has so much grace and God has so much mercy that he saturated my very being and he protected me while I was in the midst of being a fool. <laughs> and it was at that time when I had gotten myself so low and I just didn't think that I could get out of it. 
I wanted to take my own life. I had went to California. I had ran track, me and my buddy Roosevelt and Charles Trevelyan and Jeff Guerin and Charlie Craig was our coach and we had a great time. And we won a lot of races. We were the California, we were the conference champions. The first time Cal State had ever had a conference champion, we were the champions. And we raised our fist in the air as champions. We did a lot of amazing things. But at the same time, there were some things that we shouldn't have been doing. And I'm just gonna speak for myself. I came back home with no gold medals. I came back home, I hadn't made the Olympic team. I came back home and squandered some of the opportunities that I had. I, I came back home with no, edu no, no degree. I came back home to me as a failure. And I came back into an environment again that I thought I had left. And I went and I bought some liquor, some wine, and I bought some sleeping pills, and I began to, to take the sleeping pills and drink wine and drive all around the city. And it began to take effect of me when I finally stopped to get gas. And I found myself stuck on Greenfield and school crab. I couldn't get out of the, the middle of the, of the street. And thanks be to God that a friend and a couple of friends saw me right there and recognized my car. And they called an ambulance and they got me to the hospital and I got my stomach pumped. It was the worst experience I ever had. But when I was laying down on that hospital bed wondering if I was going to live or die, I said, yes, Lord. If you just allow me to live, I said, yes, Lord. And God woke me up out of that. I think I had an out-of-body experience. God pulled me up out of my spirit. My spirit, I could see myself laying down. I thought I was dying, but God was restoring me. God was encouraging me. God was lifting me up. And as soon as I got out of that hospital the very next day after seeing a psychiatrist, I went to church that next day, still had the same party clothes on. I probably still smelled the same way, but I went up to the pastor when he said the doors of the church is open. And I told the pastor, I'm here to say, yes, Lord, God has called me to the ministry. That was over 30 years ago. And today I'm a licensed and ordained minister of the of the gospel. I love the Lord with all my heart, soul, and mind because even my Lord and Savior had to say yes, Lord, as I come to a close. When he was in the garden of Gethsemane, he said, Lord, Father, if this bitter cup would pass, but the Father said, no, that cup cannot pass because Rod Dickerson's sin is in that cup. Your sins are in that cup. The whole world's sin is in that cup because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So I need you to drink that cup. And yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He made him an open shame and he was lifted up high on the cross. They hung him high and stretched him wide. He hung his head for me. He died. But that's not how the story is. But in three days, I said in three days, he got up with all power, Holy Ghost power, healing power, deliverance power, all the power, inexhaustible power, mercy power, love power. He got up with all power. And all God says, just say yes, Lord. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God have raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Just say yes, Lord. And if you have never said yes, Lord, this is an opportunity for you to join the family of God. This is an opportunity for you to be placed in the body of Christ. This is an opportunity for God to be your father, whereby you can cry, Abba, Father. This is your opportunity. Say yes, Lord. Say yes, Lord. 
Well, this has been an amazing lesson. I feel so good, and I know you feel good too, because you know that God loves you. And until next time, just keep on praying. Keep trusting in the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind. Keep following his way because he's the potter and you're the clay. If you're falling off, just get back on the wheel. The potter will continue to mold and shape you into his image. Paul said, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable will of God. I'll see you next time. Trust in the Lord. Let thy will be done. Just say, yes, Lord. Once again, my name is Rod Dickerson. I enjoyed you. Till next time, stay safe. Wear the mask, wear gloves. Keep things clean and sanitized. Keep your social distancing until Jesus comes. Well, until <laughs> we have a cure until we know for sure that God has said it's all right. In Jesus' name, talk to you again.